Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the online memory afternoon from the Warm and Toasty Club. My name's John O'Casson, and this is episode 49. 49, one week away from being 50. Can't believe it. As you probably know, anyone that joins us regularly, we've been going for nearly a year now during all manner of lockdowns. There's been all sorts of things going on. Apparently, there's a pandemic out there. I don't know. I've not been outside of the house for a year. Um, I have a little bit, I lie. Um, what we got today's show? What have we got on today's show? We've got the memory of the week, of course, as always. Here's the seed to show you the theme of the show, really. What were your favourite shops when you were growing up, when you were a kid? Sorry, I've got a squeaky chair. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, it's not me. It's not my leg. Um, what were your favourite shops as you were growing up? Where did you go to? Where were you allowed to go to? Certainly, I remember Woolworths and places like that. And joke shops in Hackney in London oh yeah um talk about that more in a little while we've got the retro raffle of course we've got Jeanette's poem of the week we have a very special guest the uh esteemed poet um singer songwriter all-round talented chap Martin Newell will be over from Wivenhoe he's flying in later on the helipad at the rear um and he'll be joining us excited about that We've got a return, a return of the playground equipment of the week. I know two pieces of playground equipment battle it out. It's going to be fun, fun, fun all the way till daddy takes my T-bird away. And joining us today is with their massive cup, if it's still on screen by the time I see it, is Jeanette Lyons and Tom Hardy. Jeanette, look at the size of that. I, know. <laughs> I do love a big bucket of coffee or tea. You're not going to mess around with little cups. No. I, I do have an espresso now and then in a little cup, but this is a big, this is some um, black coffee. I don't know if you can see that in there. Um, yeah, and yeah probably the about three quarters of a pint. <laughs> Very it. nice. It's an Alice in Wonderland more. cup, isn't yeah. it? It is, yeah. I, I, I didn't take a pill to make me small or drink anything to make me big. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Maybe you Hi, did. Hi, Tom, how are you? <laughs> I'm all right, thank you. Yeah. How are you? You're looking really well. <clears throat> you're both looking absolutely lovely and it's the sunshine on tom hardy which i like and and on you johnny as well you're both looking really it's, sunny. it's fake sunshine on me i've actually got a light to the side of me there like, uh, like can you turn it off and, uh, oh i see yeah yeah, yeah i can't turn it off because it's scary it is can you really do scary. kind of like you know shadow animals i don't look well, i can't like i know what to do hang on i can do a moth <laughs> i could probably do a little rabbit on my face little... Yeah, that's what I'd like to see, please. Shadows. Yeah, I've, I've got, never I've been able fake, to do those things. Yeah, I've got a fake light here as well. Have, Have you? you? Yeah, through the window. I've put a big light outside because it's really <laughs> dull out. <laughs> it's oh, interchangeable, I think you would call it. I think it's um, it's not that bright out there, but it does seem to kind of light up in here. Maybe because of all the white furniture. I don't know. Good though, all the overexposure. Hello, no wrinkles. Hello, how are you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> I found me, I found me back scratcher, so all's well in the world, <laughs> <laughs> and it's extendable. Oh, excellent! Can you do mine as well, then, please? <laughs> Can you reach across? <laughs> yeah. yeah, hold on. What way do you go? <laughs> oh, you can never work uh, out that way. There we go. Well, hopefully we're live. I'm waiting for people to join us because I can't see Facebook. We've we've got oh, we've got uh, eight people, but nobody's nobody said anything. Nobody's uh, commenting. A lot of people right. like to, a lot of people like to watch. Um, I was talking to um, a lovely lady, um, Irene, and her lovely husband Colin in the week, and they were speaking very well of you, Jeanette. Um, oh, really? <laughs> I don't know if you'd offered them money. It was that good <laughs> what they were saying about you. Oh, um, all right. But they often say they have their lunch run now. Hi, Irene and Colin. Um, and they, they were listen. Lovely. I like, remember meeting them. They were very nice people. They listen like um, like a radio show. Oh, that's nice. What? So they don't look at us. <laughs> we've got faces for radio. <laughs> well, yeah, we've got faces for radio. I should bring myself back. I've gone big time. I've gone close up. Uh, Sorry about I can't that. I'm going as far as my wire goes. Yeah. Now you're all right, but I've gone oh. really big headed, Jono. <clears throat> 
I do have oh, a very, got... very tiny head. Just don't be comparing with me. Uh, I wear children's take... size hands. Yeah, really John has taken the getting bigger pill, I think. <laughs> and... I've, I've got your cup. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you've, well, you've taken... <laughs> I've got your espresso little cup. <laughs> oh, bless you. God bless you. Oh, I can see people now. <clears throat> Hello yeah. to you. Can't believe it's a week gone by again, says Christy. Hi, Christy and Brian, the innocent one. Um, yeah, I know. Doesn't it fly? What I was just saying, Christy, at the start, episode 49, we're one week away from 50, and the end of the month will be a, um, our celebration. Gold, golden Not, celebration? Yeah, I don't know if we should be celebrating a year sort of in lockdown, really. <laughs> Yeah, but um, we could have done, you know, a year of not doing this. Imagine that. What empty, empty Friday afternoons we'd have had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. It's a lot to celebrate in that we've done things and people have been with us. And we've had over, I think it's over 21,000 views so far on our shows, which is pretty nifty. Um, hi, Carol. Hope you're all well, says Carol. Carol, we hope you're well. Um, hi, Sandra. Hi to Tom Hardy, who's sitting over there beside me. Hi, Jenny Lifko, the queen, former queen of the retro raffle scene, reinstated recently as the queen of the retro raffle scene. Ian Fergood. Oh, hello, Ian. The sun oh. just come out. Figure. Well, Ian, we've got a bit about you later on, so do hang around. Um, lovely chap, Ian Fergood. Um, we've got Irene, who I was just talking about. Hi, Irene. It's good to know you're here. And Colin as well. And we've got for you the retro raffle. I just it's the retro raffle, and it's coming to your screen. It's the retro raffle, never has been seen. It's the retro raffle, and it's coming, it's coming to your screen. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it's coming, it's coming to your screen retro raffle facebook live yeah 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 so we're back with a retro raffle two questions two virtual prizes let's see what the first price will be um i think the first prize should be this selection of carrier bags <laughs> this selection of carrier bags from back in the day that i've sourced from um <clears throat> dirty barry in the week <laughs> He brought these over. We've got WH Smiths. They're all plastic, so don't put them in the sea. Um, that we've got Woolworths. It says for top records. I like that. We've got our price records, where I used to buy lots of ones, and also um, the fabulous CNA, which, if I think right, you used to have one in, in Colchester, a CNA. Is that right? Am I thinking right? Is my we head did. on? I think it was near um, or. In where TK Maxx is around there, I think. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, I used to get all my records I... from CNA. <laughs> <laughs> it's a living thing, what a terrible <laughs> thing to lose. Um, that, was that was the a first good record one. my little brother bought. <clears throat> That's the first record I ever bought, ELO, oh. living thing. Yeah, my mm -hmm. little brother too. I also remember saving up to buy a record and I decided to go to Woolworths and I bought Amy Stewart and it was a double A side of Light My Fire and um, another song I can't remember but um, <laughs> it, was, it was a regret I always had through <laughs> life I only remember buying one record from um, from Woolworths <laughs> short term memory loss uh, Woolworths records and that was in the 90s and I heard a record on the radio and I liked it so much that I wrote it down and went to Woolworths next time I was near one and asked for it and it hadn't come out yet and it was uh, Incidentals by Alicia's Attic and I love it and if ever I do karaoke that's one of my go-to songs. Is it out now then? Yeah it was in the <laughs> 90s. <laughs> Nobody's heard of it out. now. <laughs> it, it never really did make it but I really liked it. <laughs> Right, so I hope I'm not too loud. I'm not too loud, am I, Tom? Tom, tell me I'm not too loud. No, you're good, fine. Good. Keep moving the mic around. So, ladies and gentlemen, two multiple choice questions. Here's the first one. To win yourself those lovely, lovely plastic bags. Um, after all, we do need more plastic bags in our life. I tell you what, just quickly, I just realised this week that the bag, uh, the, the, the sideboard that was full of 
plastic bags that I used to get at bags for life and never bring back to the shop. Like it was packed in the cupboard full of bags for life. It's it's run out after lockdown because I've what? not been to a shop. <laughs> I've run out. Like when I've given them away, passed them out. How can you ever run out of bags for life? It's just outrageous. I just First question. In the boot of my Sorry, car. You, you I, might... I'm always in the boot of the car. Yeah, you should keep those. Yeah. I Don't give them those. away. Don't give them no, away. Right. Here's the question, but you're not going to win them because Tom says I should keep them. Um, <laughs> what did the letters in the famous shop CNA stand for? And it's a multiple choice. Was it A, care and attention? B, Clemens and August? C, clothing and artifacts? Or D, <laughs> Cardis and Ankies? <laughs> <laughs> What, what, what one of those was it? <laughs> I'll There's read them out if you want them again. An interesting fact about um, CNA, uh, when they, yes, please, oh, yes. back in the 80s, I had a, a, a guy that I used to see a bit from Holland, and um, they yeah. had CNA in Holland as well, in Rotterdam. And I asked, um, he said that they were known to everything there that cost an apple and an egg. <laughs> and you know how wow. we have the expression when something's expensive we say it costs an arm and a leg i don't know a cheap version of that but they are, they didn't have the expensive one they just had when it's really cheap it costs an apple and an egg and that's what they always used to say about cna cna an apple and an egg um the uh hello El elmy she said, sorry for being late. Outrageous, Elmi. Outrageous that you're late. We love that you're here anytime, Elmi. Um, Jenny's going to see. Gary, I'm not even going to go there. Um, it's an afternoon show. Outrageous. Yeah. Can you we block Gary, please? Um, <laughs> C for Elmi. Uh, Gary says, cheap as chips. Well, they may have been. So I'll give them again. Oh, yeah. What did the letters in the famous shop C and A stand for? Was it A, care and attention? B, Clemens and August, C, clothing and artifacts, or D, Cardis and Ankies? Um, <laughs> I like Cardis and Ankies. <laughs> I think that's a lovely name. It could be. Um, Christine says, thank you for the mag. Lovely to see my um, grandparents on the front. Ah, oh, yes, the latest one. Have I got it in my selection box here? No, it's out in the hallway. Um, the new <coughs> newsletter is out, and I've just sent it out to people. And on the front is a memory map that was made by Alison Stockmar um, for our um, one of our Memory Afternoons projects. And it includes photos of people's, when they were younger, their, their parents, their grandparents, interwoven with a map of Colchester. It's been on display at Colchester Arts Centre. And we thought, what a nice thing that, to put it on the front of the new newsletter. So if you haven't got that, um, it will be out to you soon. It was I posted it the other day, so I'm pleased that arrived quickly. Chrissy, um, and I'll show you the cover in a bit. Elmi says they live down the road from me in Holland. And is that the people you're talking about, Jeanette? I think, yeah, maybe the not the people that I knew, the guy that I used to see, <laughs> but the people that um, owned CNA or whose names, maybe. Oh, OK. okay. I'm guessing. What else have Carol, we talked about? Maybe, going to maybe it was the bloke you went out with. Yeah, I don't think so. Here's Rotterdam. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra got a, a newsletter today as well. Good. And CNA was Elmi's favourite shop. Absolutely. I'm going to give you the answer. Nobody's getting it. It wasn't actually uh, clothing and artifacts. C. It wasn't <laughs> A, care and attention. And it wasn't D, Cardis and Ankies. It was actually B, Clemens and August. I think they were the uh, founders. I can't remember what country they came from. It what? could have been a country like Holland. Uh, I think it might have been. Uh, I think Elmi Holland knew who it was. <laughs> yeah, maybe they did. Um, so I'm keeping those bags. <laughs> That's the good news. <laughs> you were anyway. <laughs> the, the extra good news is the next prize. I've got it. I'll give you a quick flash here. That's the quick flash. You might recognise that if I flash that at you. <laughs> and um, this is this this is with the book. This is the actual book of Green Shield stamps. Um, oh yeah, Elmi meant B. She said after I said it. <laughs> Um, you can win yourself a full book of Green Shield stamps, and I've been told they are still usable at the co-op stores locally. 
<laughs> I used to go in and ask them and they'd look at me funny because it would always be young shop assistants who were about 18. Do you take green shield stamps? What? Um, was it, it was uh, co-op that used to do them the most, wasn't it? I don't know. Didn't they have their no, own? They, they had co-op they, they, stamps, they, didn't they? Yeah, they had co-op stamps. They were blue ones. And I think green shield were Tesco. No wonder she was right. looking at you funny in the shop. No wonder she was looking at me funny. She <laughs> thought I was a local weirdo. Yeah, doesn't he mean co-op stamps? <laughs> yeah. And they're blue. What, they're not green? What, what's he going on about? Yeah. I could have swore on my life, on my actual life, that my mum well, used to use them in the co-op. We'll probably find out in a minute, won't we? Yeah. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Elmi, sorry you didn't win that last prize. She said she forgot the order you said it in. So she was going through them like one by one to see if she get it right. Here's the question to win some green shield stamps virtually, of course, of course. No self-respecting vintage shop based quiz can be held without mentioning Woolworths, of course. What was Woolworths maximum uh, priced item in Britain until the World War Two? What was the maximum price of an item in Britain until World War Two? Was it a one penny? B, fruppence, C, sixpence, or D, one pound? It's I have no board. idea how much things cost back then. And Sandra's on our side, look. Is she? They had it own co-op stamps. Ah, uh, yeah. Ah, uh, she's on the, they, the enemy were side. Red ones? Were they red stamps, do I remember, or were the books red? I thought they were blue, the co -op Yeah, book. I thought they were blue, but I'm kind of thinking now red stamps. My mum always used to have loads of books and stamps, and she'd make a stick them the, in sometimes. Or... Yeah, it's the butlins pontins argument with the coats again, you know. Oh. So is it yeah. blue or is it red? Oh. I'll leave that with you for a while. Were they, were they just covered in stamps? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see who gets that right. What was Max, Woolworth's maximum priced item in Britain until World War II? Was it A, one penny, B, fruppence, C, sixpence, or D, one pound? Uh, da -da. You know, take your time, people. No, We're just joining in. All day. No, yeah. just joining in, look. No, they're they're not old in. enough is... to remember. That's what it is. Or um, like me, they're old enough to have forgotten everything. <laughs> it's very true. This is a very historic one. It isn't sort of um, in most people's memory, but... I thought people liked a bit of history. Mm -hmm. Christine's going sixpence. Oh. And Sandra's going blue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably over the over the stamps or the or the uh, red coat, blue coat. Oh, <laughs> Jenny, it's getting very complicated. Or, now. Oh no, actually, I hope she's all right. Sandra could be just going blue. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> so she's reporting that and we're making light of it. She's got a bit sad. She's got Blue, blue. Um, Jenny, the queen of the, the retro raffle scene, has gone C. I'm going to call it for Jenny and Christine. You are right. The maximum price of uh, in Britain in Woolworths until the World War Two was sixpence C. And their chain, the chain's motto, the shop's motto, was nothing over sixpence. Apparently, which I never knew, which I've just discovered this week, and it fulfills my life's ambition. <laughs> You feel fulfilled. So they'll be sent. <laughs> they'll be sent to you, Chrissy and Jenny. It, uh, they're going Royal Mail, so you might get them in a couple of days. You might get them in a couple of months. Probably never. Um, but we shall see. We shall see. But thanks for taking part. Our oh, co-op books is why Sandra um, says that Sandra says went blue screen stamps. Blue. I can't even say it. I can't even get my words out today. My apologies. <laughs> It's upset you so much. It has upset me. Yeah, <laughs> they're not green shield stamps at the co-op. No, can't I just say blue green shield stamps and then I still get the green in? It still feels all right. <laughs> there we have the retro raffle. Now, we have something one coming up, Mr. Ian Thurgood. Um, I should just play the jingle first. <clears throat> interesting facts. Some interesting facts about you, what you've done in your life. Some interesting facts about you, the places you've been, the people you've seen.
So I'm going to hand over to that lady in the middle. Where's she at? She's in the middle. I'm in the um, middle. <laughs> the, our roving reporter, who's going to have a job for life now. She's rather fantastic. We're oh, going to be asking you. her to go around Colchester and surrounding areas and interview people, hopefully in their gardens. Um, time is coming. Soon be, soon be getting physical, wouldn't it? We soon could be physical with one another, can't we? Yeah, not yet, though. Um, not Garden yet. visits from the end of March, I think. Unless you're working yeah. and interviewing people, and then that's okay. And I think you can exercise with people. and um, In their garden. Or or in their village. <laughs> or their next village. The I, I say that because I had the very great pleasure of um, interviewing Ian Thurgood uh, last weekend. And we... We're we're good friends, and we our thing that we do is we go for walks together, long walks, and a few times a year, and it's really nice. And he's one of the most interesting people ever, and it's so lovely that he comes and joins the show. And uh, so we decided that we'd do an interview with him and ask him a few questions about um, his history of work because he's had a very interesting job. He worked as joint managing director of Wilkin and Sons Tiptree Jam Factory. I mean, wow, what a job. And so I interviewed him and I recorded some of the interview. And of course, you know, we chatted for so long. We had a two hour walk first and then sat for an hour chatting and recording. Some of the recording didn't work because the SD card ran out and things like that. And, and there was a lot of noise. He had a neighbor drilling, there were birds and, and the microphones were very sensitive. So um, anyway, it's all been trimmed, but we had this really nice chat. And I asked him, uh, firstly, um, how did he start working at Wilkin and Sons and when? And he said he worked there for 40 years and started off in the farm and then worked his way up through sales and became a um, joint managing director. And I think we'll hand it over for a few more uh, bits of information from Ian now. I hope. Let's hand it over to uh, Ian and I'll, hopefully you'll get the, enough volume from this. Let's have a go. We're trying something out. We're on a video screen. Bear with us one second. Here comes Ian. Just telling me about the tea room. The first Tiptree tea room. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and I, I got in touch with Lodge Coaches, Robert Lodge. Um, the other side of Chelmsford, and he brought the first coach load in. And we had 60 people. They came in, and they used the loo, and they had a cup of tea, and then they brought some things in the jam shop, and they got on the coach and seemed to be very happy. And it, oh, that went rather well, didn't it? And um, it's funny because we had coach load after coach load coming in, and we'd never considered doing that if it hadn't been for Fiona, oh. um, who, who started this off. So. And it, funnily enough, Rob, Robert Lodge is a friend to this day, and he does stupid things. He finds challenges for us, and he gets me to do things that I'm afraid I don't want to do, you know, like going in a biplane. And he got me in one of these uh, boats, a speedboat once, where you lay on it like on a motorbike, and we race across the water at 80 miles an hour. And when we got there, I said, Robert, I can't swim. <laughs> he said, well, don't fall off. Um, <laughs> Sound advice. Yeah, so, yeah, what a lovely friendship. Um, all through Fiona saying we should have a tea room. Of course, Tiptree ended up with, I don't know what, they've got eight or nine tea rooms a now. Dozens now, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, they're very uh, successful. Well, well done. It's fun. <laughs> I like that. Um, so, with the products at Wilkin and Sons, um, they don't just do jam, I know. And what are your top three? What do you like to eat? Well, um, I like tawny marmalade. Uh, it's a story of its own. It's different, um, you know. And again, they typically don't put caramel in it. What they do is cook it three times, and it caramelises naturally and gives us this wonderful flavour. Um, you haven't like... just given away a trade secret, there, have you? No, I think people, <laughs> nobody would want to do that. You see, cook it three times. It takes ages and costs money. Um, I don't like pips, so my favourite jam is raspberry seedless, bar none. It's got a wonderful, intense flavour, flavour, a texture. If I'm going to make a Victoria sponge, it needs to have the raspberry seedless. And I think the other thing that I like is um, onion relish, mm. uh, because onion relish can go 
with almost anything. You know, it can can be with fish and chips if you want, or sausage and chips. It, it, it it's most extraordinarily versatile thing. Um, so yeah, th- those would be my top three. Very nice. And uh, lastly, you in, you started your retirement a few years ago. How are mm. you enjoying retirement, and what do you do with your time now? <laughs> Yeah, I, I packed up. This is coming up five years now, and um, you find your way at first. You know, you're not sure what you're going to do. You just know that it, it, the time has come to do something else. Forty years in one one business um, is probably enough. And uh, I uh, at first, so I, I didn't really know what I was going to do. And then somebody said to me, "Do things that you find rewarding." Um, and that was the wisest thing anybody said to me in a long time because since then I've been doing things that I find rewarding and it could be sitting in the garden it could be opening a fresh bottle of red wine it could be going for a walk with a friend such as you <laughs> um, we do that from time to time don't we, we? Do. Thank and, you. Uh, and, and we're now sitting in your garden which looks immaculate <laughs> and beautiful yeah and I, I do I do some gardening which surprised me really and um, I do I just I fill the time so easily. Uh, I'd recommend it to people, but make sure you're finished with working before you go to retirement. I'd, I'd hate to think you get pushed and you retire without wanting to. Ah, yeah. Um, and, and having a plan for retirement is... Uh... Well, my plan was no plan, really. Um, <laughs> it was just see what comes along. I've done some consultancy work, but, you know, that's... That's interesting when it comes up, but it's not everything. I, I do gardening work for people. Who ever thought that I would do gardening work for people? Um, I'm even finding out the difference between a weed and a plant. And, <laughs> uh, and I go to cricket a lot, which I love. It's, it's cricket. I became a steward there. And that means that when I finish stewarding for the day, I can go and watch some cricket. So the days are full. They really are. Well, thank you very much for finding the time to, first of all, have a walk with me today, and then, secondly, for letting me ask you a few questions and sharing some of your memories with our participants. Look look forward to the next walk, Jeanette. (coughs) There we go. Ian, what a lovely gentleman. He is. He's very unassuming as well, which is so lovely. When he's had this uh, incredible career... The, in in the mo- one of the most successful companies internationally, everybody knows the little pots of jam that you get in hotels all over the world, and and he's just this unassuming man. You would never know. He's absolutely lovely. He's really good company as well. Yeah, I nice. thought it was. Uh, I hope people could hear it. Right, I could hear it fine here, but obviously I'm on the control. But um, <laughs> hopefully people could hear it. Um, and I kind of liked. You could tell that he'd been sort of like. Um, at the top uh, uh, with tip tree jams with the uh, way he spoke about the sort of onion relish and uh, mm. it can go with anything yeah. um, <laughs> and the way he spoke about the sort of jam without the seeds and you can put some in the victoria sponge recipe um, yeah. it's really nice because everybody seems to us. have their favorite don't they i know one of tom's favorites there is it their ketchup tom Mm, we have yeah, to and then you've talked yeah. about that before because we we took some of our uh, Friday afternoon before lockdown we took some of our Enoch House warm and toasty participants out for a cream tea yes. at the jam factory and um, yes. it's, we, we all kind of went into the shop afterwards and uh, <laughs> bought a few things here and there it was lovely yeah. but they're banned from there now aren't they they made they're banned. Of trouble. <laughs> yeah, they made a lot of trouble <laughs> a lot of trouble Carol <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, it's lovely. It's a very interesting place to go and have a look at the factory um, museum there. But Ian, Ian is just fascinating. He's always got so many stories to tell. And that interview, there was there was other questions as well, which you know didn't come out in that. Two hours of it. <laughs> Two hours of it. <laughs> <laughs> Two hours of walking, and then an hour of interviewing. But there's so much chatting because he's just such easy company. Yeah, um, and apologies for me that I had to cut out the earlier part when you was walking down the street. There was too many wind noises and all sorts, well, not from you or Ian. But it wasn't. That was just a different recording device that was way too sensitive. But did you hear the, the plane going over, all the birds singing, the, the neighbourhood drill? It was just... Oh. When you do your future ones, as you've got a job for life now, when you do your future interviews, it's fine to do them with planes going over and somebody <laughs> doing some work next door. Um I thought it was lovely. He's with us on the chat, Ian. Thank you very much. You're a top gentleman. He says, thanks all. 
you have the most amazing show. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind coming from someone as yourself who's got an amazing story to tell and many more memories being built, I'm sure, watching the cricket and gardening, <laughs> which is the, I think in life, it's nice to be easily pleased. And that doesn't mean you have to do something really complicated. And he described retirement really beautifully. Um, he did. And, and the gardening mention... side of things is um, we've got Martin Newell coming up on the show as well. And I know he has worked yeah. as a gardener and just, you know, who doesn't like gardening really? Absolutely. Martin, we will be with you soon. We've just got to do the memory of the week and then we'll be over to you. Looking forward greatly to the, the wonderful Martin Newell. Um, just on, on Ian's story, Elmi says another interesting story. Carol, um, the troublesome one. Um, no, not really. She's <laughs> lovely. She says brilliant interview. Um, and she says something. I knew you would blame me, Tom, referring to an earlier conversation. <laughs> so thanks to Ian. Thanks for coming on, mate. And thanks for tuning in and being on the chat. We think you're a smasher. Um, what a lovely gentleman. And yeah, like I say, Jeanette, keep them coming. Job for life. <laughs> you I know don't all the people all. in I the local it. area. You know all the, the interesting people in the local area. <laughs> Go for walks with them. Okay. Well, Ian and I yeah. are going to do Alton Water next, and that's eight and a quarter miles. So, yeah, I won't record Ooh, anything yeah. there apart from me huffing and puffing, probably. <laughs> I bet. Eight and a quarter miles. Can't imagine such a thing. Um, so, memory of the week. Before we get to the lovely Martin Yule, we the sort of theme for the week is favourite shops, shops that you used to go to. Um, I'll quickly just start, if I may, just because I'm I'm cheeky like that. I dominate everything. Uh, I just wanted to mention, when I was a kid, we were talking the, the other day with my wife, I used to go to a joke shop in Hackney, near Hackney Swimming Bars. And I loved to go in there because you could buy... Um, you could buy this chewing gum if you picked it. It had a sort of mouse trap thing that you'd catch your fingers on. You had itch, itchy dust or itchy powder. Itchy powder. Uh, stink, stink bombs, which were big at Hackney Downs Secondary School, formerly the grocers. <laughs> they were like little bottles, and you broke them under a chair in your class, and the whole place would clear out. Stunk like anything. And I don't know if anyone remembers the cigarettes that had the red on, but these ones had talcum powder in them. So you blew them, which is not really good to eat. So hopefully they blew them rather than sucked. But you blew them and a little cloud of talcum powder come out, making believe it was um, it was cigarette smoke, which of course it wasn't. Um, whoopee cushions, all sorts. And also went to a shop just one down from uh, the swimming bars at Acne. And I bought a tennis table tennis racket that lasted me for years. Used to love playing after school. Anyway, do you remember your favourite shops as a school people out there? Let me go to Tom Hardy. He's over there on that side. Or is he over there on that side? Is he that, <laughs> he's that side. I can't drive. Where's um, my head? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, Jeanette. Tom, do you, do you remember favourite shops as a kid? Um, I think we just used to like sweet shops, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember those at the top end of Grinstead where the the Tesco's is used to be Mr. J's, I think. And he used to have like a little sweet shop bit next to his supermarket. And so, yeah, we always used to pop in there and get our sweets after Mr. school. J's. Yeah. So that was probably, yeah. That was probably well, it. Yeah. I'm just, I don't think I really went in shops very much. I don't think I was allowed. Okay. Yeah. That's I was banned. Enough. Yeah, I was banned uh, like yeah. Carol. Yeah. After that incident. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we don't talk about <laughs> yourself, Jeanette. I can't you, remember you was going poor, to shops. So you probably Yeah, yeah we you were was very that poor. poor. Didn't yeah. go to shops. But yeah. I do remember um going to a chip shop and I think occasionally we as a family would have fish and chips and I would be sent to go and get them. And I remember asking for scraps. I don't know if they still do them in chip shops now. Yeah. I so rarely have them. But yeah. I wouldn't eat them now because they'd just be so greasy and horrible. <laughs> the scraps, they were just bits of the batter that fell off of the fish and they'd just scoop them off the top of the, the fat mm. and they'd just be soaked in it. And you, I don't know. That, that, I remember that, scraps. <laughs> yeah, I've got a relative who, I won't name him for the shame of it, um, <laughs> who used to go and ask for scraps. I mean, when I was young, if you wanted a bag of chips, I remember say, saying to myself, I'm going to save up and buy a bag of chips. It was two and a half pence at one point. Two New money. I, oh, I remember old money. 
It's happened oh, so you're, many. But you're quite old, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> or I've got a very good memory of the 70s, 60s and 70s. How much were <laughs> they in old money now. then? I don't remember old money, but how do, much They were big they? pennies, really big pennies. And, and before oh, that, ahead. hay pennies as well. Half pennies were really big. But Not, a, chip, a bag of chips would be a big penny. I can't remember. I, th I think it was maybe tuppence. I, tuppence, I tuppence. <laughs> I, think yeah, that I can't was remember the, exactly, but I just remember yeah. the, you know going to the chip shop and having big pennies. And, and I think you've pennies. confused that with bird food, haven't you? Have I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the maybe the scraps cost a penny. <laughs> Don't know. Well, um, Sandra remembers scraps. Um, she remembers them. So there's that people out there. What other shops did you used to go to? I mean, if you think about it, a big one when we were, uh, people were a kid for many generations was Woolworths and their pick and mix. Um, did anyone go to CNA with their parents, perhaps in Colchester when they were a kid? Uh, what other shops were there? Oh, God, I've got a blank now because little areas have different kind of yeah. shops. I remember there was a clothes shop in Colchester called Maddox, and it was a fashion Maddox, shop for yeah. girls. And um, there was, yeah, I guess when I was about 12 or 13, and it was in the high street, bottom of the high street, kind of near where, um, oh, we're near the Three Wise Monkeys now. And, um, yeah, they, they, the fashion at the time that I remember was like pinafore dresses with... Um, big wide straps and huge big buttons and then just straight down kind of this jersey fabric and that's what I used to wear to school and um but yeah you could kind of just some of their clothes you could just about get away with for school but then they'd have proper like going out clothes that for teenagers going out uh, out 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 yeah <laughs> Which, you know I couldn't do much of that but I did look about 18 when I was about 13 so I was able to go out out but, yeah, I can't comments. remember that clothing shop sure. called Maddox. There's a few comments coming in. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, Carol says, my favourite shop was a sweet shop in Vicky Park Road, over the road from where I lived. It had jars and jars of different sweets. I would spend most of my time in there. <laughs> Absolutely. Love those old-time sweet shops with jars. And they'd have to go on a ladder. to. Yeah, I want those ones right at the top, the midget gyms. Um, sweet peanuts, please. Um Thomas, he went to Woolworths on a Saturday morning to buy the latest vinyl singles. That's my same, little brother. Same here. That's my little brother, What's Tommy. That? Tommy. Is that your little brother? Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. He's he lives, calling he himself Thomas. Kent. He don't like to be. He don't like that Tommy. <laughs> he wants Thomas. He's respectable nowadays. <laughs> Must he call him little he's Tommy? Like, he's, he's about a foot or two taller than me. <laughs> He'll fella. give you a clip around the ear. He will. Yeah, he would. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, Saturday morning to buy the latest vinyl singles as well as our price. Four of us were great for that. Sandra, daughter, worked at CNA. Oh, okay. Nice one, Sandra. Um, Pollard's for me underwear, says Sandy. Um, thank you for that, Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> Where was Pollard's? I don't remember that. Was I that Colchester? Know. Was it run by Sue Pollard from Heidi High? <laughs> um, <laughs> and then just and to answer it after that. Yes, she re Sandra remembers Maddox. Yeah. So that was Ruth Maddox, also from High. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so there was a link up there going on. Um, Sandra worked. In yeah. Sorry, Tom. The Heidi I people, they all lived in Colchester. Yeah. They all lived in Colchester. I thought it was Wales. Um, Wasn't it filmed round here? Is it Clacton? <laughs> I think it might. I think it was. It was filmed in Pollards and Maddox, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> Sandra worked at the old Walmsys, the really old one with wooden floors and doors. Wow. I think I remember a story where they used to have pats of butter and used to get the wooden sort of slab patter things and you'd pat them together and then you'd serve it and people would eat it with their mouths. Sandra <laughs> says Canvey Island was Pollards. Ah, that's why. Ah, that's why we don't that know. I wonder. She still has the same underwear. <laughs> <laughs> oh sandra what is he doing to you oh, not sandra sorry sandra it's sandy who has the same underwear we should we, we've kept him waiting long enough we have a wonderful guest today poor oh, sandra sorry about that we have a wonderful guest the wonderful martin Newell should be with us let's see if we can bring him to the Thank screen you, John. how are you there mr martin Newell? hi hi yeah yeah i was listening to all that 
I'm, I've been muted for, for your good and for the <laughs> listeners' good, probably. Yes, that's and uh, yeah, actually, there was a green the green shield stamps were for, they were given away by I can't remember who gave them away, but they, you re, you retrieved your goods or bought your goods in the green shield stamp shop, which was down the bottom of wow. Queen Street. And I remember very clearly in the seventies, a bloke broke in there and stole a load of green shield stamps, and when they the, the judge. Gave him three months in an electric <laughs> kettle. <laughs> <laughs> three months in an electric kettle. You know? <laughs> and you know, um, you know, I was talking to Howlin Wilf the other day, you know, James Hunter, now famous R&B singer. And we're talking about posts. And you know, there's a big, there's a little post box in Wivenhoe that's got VR on it. It stands for Victoria Regina. Victoria Regina. So it's, a, it's a, a, the oldest kind you can get. But he said, oh, the ER then. He said, I just thought, he said, I thought that was, it was what the postman said when he gave you your letters. <laughs> <Here you are. laughs> so, so it's simple, simple so funny. Um, right. Like, Janina, uh, Janina Doyle, she says, my guitar yeah. teacher, hi Janina, she says, my guitar teacher at school was one of the web twins from Heidi High. It's all happening here on the Heidi High front. So. <laughs> yeah, well, that used to be filmed so in Dover cool, Court, didn't it? it? It was filmed in Dover Court in the old Warners. Uh, I think it was Major Warner. It was a former soldier, and his son founded that camp. And the th signal thing about that was that the the, um, the you know the Dikenda transport kids were domiciled there when the, when when uh, Nicholas Winter brought them over on the on in various train ferries, and that's where. The, so they went to Dover Court and Harwich, and Harwich and Dover Court when the not the centenary but the seventy year anniversary of that came up, never really got the credit for that. It was that that was the first bit of English kindness that those uh, people from Germany experienced. And but Harwich never got the credit. Big important London when they did that the commemorative train, they took it there and then they just drove it straight down to London, yeah. where the the committee was there to welcome everybody and take all the glory. And I think the, some of the Harwich councillors were a bit hurt about Martin. that. Because yes, let me ask you, how do you how do you retain all this information? There's something wrong with me. It's, <laughs> a, it's, I, I don't remember really important things, you know, like things no, that like to say to say hello or say how are you. You know, it's oh, it's, yeah. a, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's seriously an Aspergic thing where someone will say, "Oh hi, Martin, how are you?" And, they are, and, and then I'll go, "Oh, we got this new band, and you know, the bass guitar is really good. We got a new keyboard, and that'll go on for 15 minutes." When the answer should have been, "I'm fine, thank you. How are you?" I'm fine. Yeah, that's yeah. what you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to do it's stuff like that. It's coming up. Yeah. Oh no, that's wonderful. Sandy says, "Martin, you're a funny, funny man." <laughs> yes. <go>. Yes. <laughs> a, few, <laughs> a few of my exes were <laughs> wouldn't probably <laughs> agree with that. Yeah. Um, well, we're very happy that you're on the show. I, I remember my my dad at... was filling in my first passport right forms. Yeah. And I was about 11 because we had to go. We didn't have to have one when I went out to Cyprus. We we're going out to Singapore. And I needed it because I changed, obviously. I'd, by the time I was 11, I'd grown a beard and things. And um, the, he looked, and there's a thing that said senior peculiar, you know, special peculiarities, whatever it was. And he looked up at me from where he's filling his form, and he just said, my God, I could write a bloody book. <laughs> 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 that was a sort of wacky yeah. fellow he was. Um, well, it's lovely to have you on the show, and not only are you going to have a nice chat with us and give us really key historical information, you're going to um, recite a, a few of your own poems? Yeah, I'll do a, do a couple of poems now, and we'll do some more later, shall we? Shall we do, I'll do a short one. This one's about HP Source, yes, which is now made cool. in Holland, but was made in Aston in Birmingham for years. Hmm. Did you know that? No, no. This so is I'm not backing stuff. out. I'm just, there's nothing wrong. It's you know, not, not a mouse life, or anything. Is, I just felt I need to stand up and do me back. Life. That's why. Is that that's Shimmy? It. Yes. You're looking good. Let us get us off screen and let us okay. introduce okay. So, so you. So you want me to do this? The marvellous Martin. And, and you can hear me all right, can you? Yeah, well, this is about HP sauce. A source of pleasure and of salt, of vinegar, of dates, of malt, of sugar, Spice and tamarinds brought in by ships on temperate winds of warmer climes where they'd grown than any British parts had known. Then cooked into a spicy brew, this sauce, this elixir, this goo. Decanted, sat upon the table, fluted bottle, pale blue label. 
poured on stakes and watery spuds to cut through cold clogged smoke fugged buds in foggy weeks on smoggy days in roadside restaurants and cafes and placed on pacalada shelves by order of the lords themselves for chips and chops the last anointment naturally it's by appointment commoner and king endorse the zing arise sir hp source yes i'm still waiting for my knighthood at the moment <laughs> i've got the trouser suit but not the not, not the hood <laughs> Yeah, yeah. A nice waistcoat too, actually, and a nice badge of some kind there. This is oh well, this is my old poppy badge, which I kept on there since. Remember, it's Sunday. We didn't do. I mean, I don't generally do the parade because you don't want people like me in a parade. <laughs> but this jacket is um, this this jacket is actually a stage jacket, and I haven't had a chance to wear it because of course nobody's been on stage. Absolutely. Oh, apart from my, when I did the Christmas show at the art centre. Well, this is our stage, Martin. Now, isn't it? Online. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's it's okay. But the real, the real, um, the real gigs are in sight now. I, I, well, I think this. About, tell us about one you've got coming up at Colchester Art Centre, dear. Uh, there's one at Colchester Art Centre. I do this thing called the Golden Afternoon, and the very last one I did was we turned the money over to the ophthalmology department which was then in Lexton Road, but is now in a special unit. It's in the old walk-in centre uh, because they do such great work. There are some brilliant surgeons there. Yeah. They're as good as any, you know, that you will find anywhere. <laughs> and they're very nice. Our eye surgeons and all the eye nurses, the ophthalmology nurses, are very compassionate people. They have to be because people are very nervous when they have, when they have eye surgery of any sort. And, and oddly yeah. enough... It's his one of the. It's it's it can be uncomfortable and it can be scary, but it's one of the least painful things you can have. And they sorted me out because I was, I had something go wrong with one eye, and I know a lot of the listeners and viewers here will have had various cataracts and eye problems, but they saved my eyesight because the other eye, when the retina detached, went out in sympathy with it, and that's because there is a certain amount of synergy between the eyes. So I, I knew something had gone wrong when they were inspecting the bad eye, and I said, would you just take a look at the other one? And this young surgeon said, hang on, and he called another surgeon in, and this, the, he was a, a retinologist, Mr. Patel, and he, he said, um, very matter-of-fact to me, to me, he just said, uh, because it was about midday, and he said, do you think you could be in here at about 8 o'clock tomorrow morning? And I said, wow, that's early, but yeah, why? And he said, because I'm going to save your eyesight. Wow. And I was there, and they yeah. did. That It was basically a tear, so it wasn't actually detached, but it was going. And if it had gone, I would be walking around with a white stick because uh, because this one, this eye was already kaput, you know, we knew it. And uh, they fixed it. And then they fixed something else, and then they got the – the cataract which had formed because when they disturb the surface you're right, you get a cataract you have to wait for it to ripen 18 months later they fixed it and suddenly i could see only one eye but one eye will do the job of about one and three quarter eyes probably yeah and it was a kind of miracle and i decided to do this gig and i called it itunes and we raised some that. money <laughs> and and actually i i should remember that there's a film of it because a documentary was being made about me at the time. And I, the film director took the whole lot. But that's not the bit that the Americans who were paying for the documentary wanted. So we've got that extra footage filmed by a proper crew. And I said, can we just slice it off? I will pay you to edit it. We'll edit it and we'll sell it. And then that can continue to generate money for the eye unit. So it's a kind mm -hmm. of, it's not exactly a charity, but it's a cause that's kind of registered. So I've, I can bung money into it. And we call it iTunes, yeah. and it's to thank those ladies and gentlemen at the ophthalmology unit. Yeah. So yeah. they are. I'm good for something sometimes. It's not just yeah, all about to, me. I used to take a relative there often and have to pick them up because they put the stuff in your eye and you can't see properly after you come out of an examination. So I know it well, or I remember it well. Unfortunately, as you say, it's gone now. Can I just give you a little bit of praise, Martin? Um Elmi's Elmi sending much applause. Thomas is saying brilliant in relation to your poem. Sandy saying what a treat to have some Martin to Martin Mule to see <laughs> here. Fab. Yeah. And um, Sandra says yes, great. 
Um, so yes, indeed, you are rather great. Um, and it's well, I can turn, I could turn up and do the live one at some point. Can't I? Well, that that would be nice. Let's let's get back to that because we, you know, word on the street is they're vaccinating people like crazy, and we might have a life back. Again we have to, done in the outside world. We've had a life, and yeah. we have a life online, and uh, we do the newsletter. You know, we have a uh, that's the uh, memory map there for Alison Stockmar on the new warm and toasty newsletter. We have telephone contact with everybody, or. We've done 23, 23 vac first vaccinations now, 23 million and about a nearly 2 million, probably gone over that, nearly 2 million seconds, which means technically, according to a, a medical guy that I, I occasionally see, is, he said, look, we've, he's a you know, public health rather than, than clinical. He says, we have actually done a third of the population, which technically is, gives us herd immunity. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. He said, I mean, this is a no-nonsense guy. He was uh, 20 years in the RAF. He said, we've, got, we've technically got herd immunity, but they don't want people to get too excited just yet because there's still plenty of COVID about. There's still some silly people having parties and that, although I would think they would stop soon. And, and we're racing ahead, much to the disbelief of some of our continental ca counterparts, who I, I'm not going to get into that, but they were, I think they were a bit silly putting, putting the AstraZeneca in it. Uh, yeah. vaccine down because th it inhibited their own population taking it up even when it was available well yeah, I'm, telling you all right now, I'm, I'm telling having mine on monday so um I'm it's good good thing to, to do it, but you yeah, might I'm, it's all right it doesn't you know you must be very brave you know that's what i said when i came out i held my mummy's hand i said i was very brave and the ghost of my mummy said yes you were here's a well, lollipop I'm, i was gonna say <laughs> if i get a lollipop it'll be all right um yeah. Martin, we're going to pop off for a little while and we'll come back to you shortly. Is that okay, sir? Don't call me shorty. Okay, thank you, darling. I'll silly. <laughs> In a minute. That's the lovely Martin Yule there. Um, what an interesting man. He holds information, some of it fantastic, some of it, I don't know if it's of use of anyone but us thinking it's fantastic. I know a great deal of it is, oh, I believe. Um, and... Um, I can't hold information like that. So I'm glad he's with us. Um, and we have time now. Tom's returned with uh, Playground Equipment of the Week. I want to go out and play with my friends. Go to the park and have a good time. Jump on the swings and the roundabout. Down the slide at the playground. Oh, Playground Equipment of the Here we are, Playground of the Week, Playground Equipment of the Week, I should say. Two pieces of equipment we're going to talk about. First up is the roundabout. Absolutely the roundabout. Some people know it as a merry-go-round. I always knew it as a, a roundabout. It's a flat disc, frequently about two to three metres in diameter with bars on it that act as both hands, uh, that, as both hands, holds and something <clears throat> to lean on whilst you're riding it. Nobody seemed to really know when it's invented. I couldn't find out via the interweb. It was likely a development of the merry-go-round, which uh, was often found at fairs and the carousel for many centuries now. When I remember it, big kids would push it really, really fast when we were little to scare us. Some might say excite, but I would say scare the smaller children on it. And Often it was that fast that they would push it that the little kids couldn't hold on the middle bit and they'd fly off <laughs> and graze their knees or something. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a great thing, the, the roundabout. I don't know about you, Tom Hardy. Um, have you used a roundabout in your time, dear sir? I did once, I think. And I got flung off, never went back. Um, That's it. Sport yep. it for you. Yeah, it did. I was ruined. Ruined. No. No, I, did like, big kids. I did like the roundabout, swinging it really, you know, turning it really quickly and then trying to jump on when it's going really quickly. Yes. That's the thing that to do. Could, that could hurt your academicals, couldn't it, really? It if you're could not if careful. you missed. Yeah. With those bars. And yeah. also, when it went really fast, Tom, did you jump off and then your whole thing would be spinning round? Yes. 
Well, yes, and then you'd fall over, wouldn't you? You'd fall over like a yeah. drunkard person. Yeah. <laughs> and Jeanette, the... I know you were poor, but did you get the chance to go around about when you was a child? I, I kind of did, but my big brother Paul, um, him and his mates would uh, be the kings of it. <laughs> and oh, yeah, wouldn't the and, and they'd spin it so fast and if we did manage to get on it or if if a mum and you know what it was like in the olden days all parents governed all children and so somebody's mum would say let her go on let the younger ones on let them on and so they'd have to but then they'd spin it so fast that would either would either be sick or would be thrown off <laughs> it made us yeah. not want to go on it so they could retain their kingdom yeah it's true the big kids were the kings of the playground weren't I they know. Tyrants. <laughs> Tyrants, yeah. And it was true. I remember that of the mums sort of like saying, let them go, let them go. And they'd behave themselves for two minutes. As soon as the mums would look away and have a fag or something, push the baby, have a fag, um, they'd, be, <laughs> they'd be back on pushing it like crazy. Um, so if you haven't watched before, the idea is we have two different things in the same sort of area. This week it's playground equipment, and we ask, we tell you a little bit about it, we talk a little bit about it, and we ask you to vote what's your favourite. So that's the idea. Let's just see what people are saying. Well, Elmi's saying to Martin Yule, what an interesting and talented man Martin is. Um, he is indeed. Um, and if we can have that in writing, I'll send it forth to him. <laughs> Sandy says, I was a Screenshot. week early on this one. Yeah, Sandy was talking about roundabouts last week, Dr. Sandy. So that probably inspired us um, to pick it pick it this week but she said i loved roundabout in my pollard's knickers <laughs> that she's still no. wearing according to tom <laughs> <laughs> that she's still wearing according to tom so that's our first item for you to consider for you to roll around in the second one is the seesaw jeanette reminded me that this was the one that i've forgotten what it was where you would push another person up and down and spring off your legs it's also known as a teeter totter totter or a teeter board. It's a long, narrow board supported by a single pivot point, most commonly located at the midpoint between both ends. As one goes, end goes up, the other comes down. Nobody seems to know also when it was invented, but the word uh, seesaw originates from the 1630s in the seesaw sake a down. Um, words in a rhythmic jingle used by children and repetitive motion workers, allegedly. Probably, uh, emit, I can't even read that. It's probably similar to the rhythmic back and forth motion of sawyers uh, working a two man saw over a wood or stone. The words to the nursery rhyme of seesaw, Marjorie Daw, reflect children playing on a seesaw and singing the rhyme to accompany their game. Seesaw, Marjorie Daw, Jack shall have a new master. He shall have but a penny a day because he won't work any faster. Um, and they did often change the name. It wasn't always Jack. It might have been Jill. It might have been, I don't know, Susie Quattro or something. Johnny. Um, I always heard it as Johnny. Would have a new mark. Oh, you heard it as Johnny? Yeah. Nice, nice. nice yes, that, Sandy is still wearing those uh, undergarments, uh, Tom, as you've been <laughs> fantasising about. Um, <laughs> not fantasising. No, that's absolutely weird. <laughs> No, sorry, Tom. <laughs> sorry. Uh, let's move swiftly on. Tony <laughs> Jane says he's not a fan of the round. He's not a fan of the roundabout. Didn't like the speed or the dizziness caused. Yeah, um, I am with him on that. But he says he does prefer a nice sea and a saw. Um, I just, I, I quite like when it was really spinning fast and you tried to grab hold. Your sort of arms would be pulled. Yeah. Your legs are flying in the air. I, I quite like that. I don't know. There's something quite nice about it. You were one of the big boys that were the kings of it, weren't you? No. Yeah, it sounded well, like I was. Were. I was at some point. Yeah. <laughs> I was a bit afraid of Sandy. You know, a bit afraid of Sandy's knickers, but I mean, you know, we, <laughs> we ran away then. I think she's been said. Um, <laughs> I remember the seesaw. If you had, you was on with a heavier person, you would really bounce, wouldn't you? Well, that's and that's you'd, hurt your, you'd, you'd hurt your academicals and your coccyx if you wasn't careful because you'd bounce so hard onto that metal thing. Did you ever go on the seesaw, Jeanette Lyons? Yes, I did. I liked it, yeah. but I was always really big for my age. I was well, not big. I was skinny, but I was very tall, and I'd have to put my little brother and little sister on one end while I was on the other, just to kind of balance it. Balance the scales. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you must have been a fan of the seesaw, Tom Hardy. But didn't 
Well, only, only when people tried to sort of knock you off the other end by jumping <laughs> on it and things. Oh. <laughs> Flying into the gardens across well, the way. Well, you'd More walk. Of a catapult. You'd, you'd, you'd stand in the middle, wouldn't you? And then sort of walk along a bit and then try and jump on the other end. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> to, to try and catapult the person. Usually somebody small with a bit of luck. I think yeah. it was probably invented. Yeah, it's probably um, invented for warfare, wasn't it? The catapult. Yeah. That's funny. I'm just looking at what Tony James has written. I bet Tom was one of the big boys, <laughs> probably one of the pioneers of Asbos. <laughs> oh, uh, Tom. I don't think that's very nice. <laughs> well, Tony says it, not me. I was just reading it. Well, you brought it up. Just yeah, rude. Up. Outrageous. Outrageous. Mm. Um, Elmy says seesaw for me, and she likes to swing. Oh, and swing, of course. Um, Christine's going seesaw. What's your vote, people? Roundabout seesaw. Roundabout seesaw. <laughs> Through the round window. Um, Christine's going seesaw. Ken, uh, not Ken. I'm thinking of Ken Deleu. I've not seen him yet today. Keith says roundabout. Christine's going. Ryan saying roundabout. <laughs> um, she's not committed yet. I'm not sure. Uh, she did. Check. I think. Yeah. No. Christine Brian. said seesaw. Yeah. Brian was on she the magic said, roundabout, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, Brian was one of the big kids. <laughs> the magic band of that. <laughs> Brian was one of the big kids, the innocent ones, they called them. Um, they were a gang of big boys who used to make this roundabout go really fast. Carol says, I like the seesaw, although I went over the top of the handlebars a few times. Yeah. Tony's apologizing to Tom. There we go. Um, trying to set the record straight. Sandra's going seesaw. Thomas is going roundabout. Janine is going seesaw. Keep the voices coming. Keep those voices coming for the seesaw or the roundabout. And uh, before Jeanette says, stop, Jono, stop. I'm just going to check my um, my situation. My situation <laughs> says we, we welcome back Mr. Martin Newell. Um, let's hope that I can find him on my uh, Esper deals. Um, there he is. Martin I'm Newell. back already, am I? You're back already, yes. We, right, we, okay. Tell Very us good. about... If you were going to pick one out of the roundabout or the seesaw, do you do you recollect either? Uh, yes, I do. Yes, yeah. We only got rid of them two two years ago when they, when the doctors <laughs> said I was better. But um, I ha I, uh, I I think I probably preferred the seesaw, but I, I didn't have anyone to play with, so I'd stand on the middle of it, kind of going like this, you know. Yes. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I do. It's because roundabouts, although they look like a great idea, I was very prone to feeling sick on them, you know. It was a wooden one that used to, yeah, you know, it was all made of wood with little planks and things like that. It looks great. It looked like a great idea. But if I was on it for a bit, uh, soon enough, I'd start feeling nauseous, you know. Martin, do, yeah. sorry to interrupt everybody. Martin, do you remember the playground in Wivenhoe? Where you did, yes. And um, a few, oh, crikey, maybe about uh, 18 years ago. We made a film, 2002. We, right. Oh, that was a good guess. Yeah. So, 17 years ago. Uh, you and I... No, that's that's eighteen, nearly nineteen years ago. Oh, coming right. out this spring, okay. yeah. Good maths, yeah. yeah. Good, you've got your yeah. Cap on. And um, we made a film, and part of the film was in that playground in Wivenhoe, and there was a, a long horse. Paul Ridley seat. Tiddley was on it. Paul yeah, Ridley Thomas, was, the hairdresser, yeah. yeah. And he he was in drag, and he yes. was on this horse. I've never seen one anywhere else. They got they're on two giant springs. And, and um, you don't want to be forward. standing behind it when it hits you in the brisket. We were talking about this last week and we were wondering what was what is the name of that piece of equipment? Because, you know, a rocking horse. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I just I don't know what it's called. I've never heard it called anything. You know, it might might be called, you know, Sturdsley or something like that. You know, but I don't just, know. I was just checking if you knew. It's an inanimate know. object. I'm not in the habit of endowing inanimate objects with names, but I do call the... Um, my vacuum cleaner, the J. Edgar. But there's lo lo lots of stuff like that, you know. Um, non Cockney, so non rhymy slang. God bless you. Um, are you going to do us another poem, Mar? You yeah, might... um, this one, this one is actually a children's program, but I wrote it for my my granddaughter who lives in Liverpool, oh. and 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 she's she's just about eight. So I've been teach I've been doing poetry online with her. You know, it's a kind of online, uh, what, do you, what do they call it, homeschooling. It's part of that. And, uh, you know, so this poem came up um, and it 
it was actually from an earlier story I'd written, but I was saying about this villain who'd been attacked by all these animals because he was always kidnapping animals. And it, when every time he kidnapped an animal, one would bite him or peck him. And it, his name was Bogrin. It said he had the most bitten bottom in Britain. And this seemed to catch on with one of my nieces. So I wrote a poem about uh, a, a, a young woman who'd got the most bitten bottom in Britain uh, for Happy children. Story. Let, us, let us get out of your way and give you the screen. And the, of course, uh, yes. So Again, we can have that if you want. Yeah, he's stand then up I'll sit later, down for a bit, a bit later, later on, sir. He'll stand up, then he'll sit down. It's Martin. Yes, I do. I will. Yeah. Miss Chardonnay Gloria Lytton had the most bitten bottom in Britain. Creatures would view it and queue up to chew it from tiger to tiniest kitten. The dogs in the town of Thames Ditton, upon catching sight of Miss Lytton, would claw at the doors and start clacking their jaws at the most bit and bottom in Britain. Now little Miss Lytton, we find, was pretty near out of her mind, till shaking her fist she recited a list of the things that might bite her behind. I'd been pecked by an eagle, nipped by a beagle, stung by a mozzie which got in my cosy, then after a ghastly attack by a wasp, it all ended up with me being taken to hospital. Don't even talk about going to a zoo, much as I'd love to. What would I do? A bottom's for sitting while sewing or knitting. You must forgive me for stopping right here, but changing the subject. Only last year I was chased through a park when I walked home at dark by a couple of badgers, a fox and some deer, all of them trying to snap at my rear. Frankly, my dear, I am awfully bored being bitten and pecked at and nibbled and gnawed, but the least I can do, since you're begging me to, is to gratefully, gracefully take this award. I'm proud in a way, said the lovely Miss Lytton, in spite of the pain of being constantly bitten. To win is so stunning and 14 years running awarded the most bitten bottom in Britain. And there we have it. <laughs> and kids love that, and so do adults, I found. I loved it. I also loved the half sitting down, half standing up stance that you brought upon yeah. the proceeding. Well, that's it. <laughs> I had to do that. I won't be in shock, will I? <laughs> yeah. And that was, one, that was one of yours, wasn't it, Martin? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah I've, I've started original. writing a collection. And, and the other thing is that that's the next written project when – uh, when when I finish this record is to get on with that because Wilf or, or James Huntridge, you know, is, is a really good cartoonist. It's a little bit like uh, a little bit like Edward Ardizoni, only a bit more funky, a bit more gritty. And um, he can do these illustrations. So he's a musician who draws and I'm, and I'm a musician who writes and we're good mates and he started doing these illustrations and they're absolutely brilliant so what we're both chipping away at in between musical projects is this book of proper rhyming children's poems and, okay. and i think kids are much smarter than you think so they they don't need like really simple mm. stuff and people jumping off wooden blocks and going hello my name's beppo what's yours they, don't, they need something to stretch them a bit and if there's a word in it which they don't understand, give them a dictionary that they can look it up in. And that's how yeah. people come up. If so the, any of the Pepo fans have been upset by this conversation. I'm not sure. No, this was a 70s creature. I remember him very well. His name was Brian. He usually had a 2-2 two, two award for someone oh, pretend yeah. university in 1970s televisual studies. And... Uh, he got a sociology degree and he's got his last and he worked in an adventure playground and then got a job as a children's presenter i'm naming no names <laughs> and uh his spectacles are always mended with a bit of elastoplast i don't know why <laughs> and he had a great big beard read. which used to frighten the children in those days the great big bushy beard read. hello I read, I read a couple of comments um sandy says new word smithery superb <clears throat> sandra says great poem Chrissy says, love your poems. Can't wait to see you at our live clubs. All right. Um, and Carol good. says, Thank very you. good. It's very good. Response. Love it from Carol. Martin, um, you talked about a lovely uh, children's book that you're working on. Anything else you want to tell us about and where we can find you so we can, Tom can put up a link perhaps. Um, where you can find me? Oh, I see. Well, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm, on, um, I'm on the book of face, of course. And on Twitter, and there is a website, but you have to probably have to look up Cleaners from Venus. But if you look up Martin and your website, Cleaners from Venus, just you can Google me. There's loads of stuff, and you know all the stuff that the um, 
that Scotland Yard have been allowed to print after 20 years. So there's lots of it there. And and a litany of complaints from women who are still having remedial surgery. (laughs) A bit rich, even for us. Um, Tom can have a look at that and put put a link up. Um, Most of them are quite old now, of course. Yeah, we um, we, we, we look, look, look to where we can find you. Um, we're going to announce, Jeanette's going to announce, you can stay there for a minute if you will, Martin, if Jeanette's going to announce our uh, Playground Equipment of the Week. Okay, and the that winner... used to be my name. <laughs> <laughs> the winner this week is Seesaw. Oh, Hurrah. Seesaw, in, Seesaw, in a real surprise yeah. move. I thought it was going to go roundabout. No, you know, no, I've been only, losing only sleep for the big scary it. boys. For the big scary boys. It's the nausea. Yeah. It's not the scariness of it. It's the yeah, but it's, it's. I know the nausea, but the thing is, it's the big scary boys that that take over the roundabout and spin it really fast. That makes you oh. sick, so you don't want to go on it. Because if you I heard, I heard yourself, a horrendous you know, story about that. It's in the north somewhere. They they fitted some sort of motor to it from a motorbike to a roundabout and this ki- and the kids were getting on it and one kid was on it for so long it made it damaged his eyes and everything and he got he got some g-force marks on his face they drove this thing at astronomical speeds only in the north no actually they prob- probably could do that in somewhere like portsmouth <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for anyone watching at Portsmouth, there will be counselling after this episode. Um, <laughs> no, it's just I've got a mechanical knowledge because they're all ships and things, aren't they? So I think it's it's a particular type of mechanical mind, you know, industrial revolution sort of mind that would think I will fit a motor to a to a children's roundabout well, like yeah, and America. see what happens. Like a merry-go-round, <laughs> yeah, like a merry-go-round. or not so merry-go-round, or a very go-round. <laughs> Very go round, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I remember seeing one in Hackney on Hackney Downs Park. They used to have a, a sort of panelled wood roundabout that was quite low, and um, an ambulance was called at one point after the fast boys had been not a pretty sight. So we won't uh, dwell on that. We were a happy, happy show. I know. Um, yeah. Now, Martin, um, a comment from Sandy says Martin's children book, children's book sounds really amazing. Kids are smart. It's going to take us a little while because we're doing, you know, he does a drawing and etc. He does, he does a bit, and I do a bit, and then when we've got enough, we'll have a book. But I would know how to get it published. Well, Martin, you don't know how to get it published. You do I, know how to. Get it published. I would know. Yeah, I would know. I would know how to get it published. Ah, that's what I thought you said. Yeah, I would know exactly how to do it. And if I couldn't get a publisher to do it, I would know how, how to get the people who assemble it and do, do, do a decent job on it because i i've done i've had a few books out so i, I know the you, drill you are, are you not um britain's most published poet i, I was i was uh for a while just by virtues it doesn't mean anything artistically I, i've said that it's just it was just a fact that when i was writing poems weekly and, and at one point for three years thrice weekly for a national newspaper hmm. it was it was I, I was just told this. Do you know you are probably the most published living poet in in England? Now there was no one. I put it up. I started calling myself that to annoy the Chrome Domes and the people in Ockers and 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 Cambo. Uh, you know, just because I like oh, no. to be annoying. You know, I don't know what that is. Oxford and That's Cambridge, Ockers, Ockers and Cambo. Oh, I don't yeah. get out much. And um and. And I just did it to annoy all the people who think they're in charge of poetry and write stuff that nobody understands, which sits in dull corners of dull bookshops forever and ever not being sold. While people like Clark and and me and Luke, young Luke Wright uh, go out and do all the all the dig work. So I just thought, yeah, I, I do like to sit on a hill and and you know put the V's up to them really because I think they ought to do more more work rather than reviewing wine or reviewing each other's work in highfalutin magazines at Armories. So. I do taunt them. I did taunt them a bit when I was young and more arrogant. And I thought it was important that I, I wanted to see if anyone would challenge me, if some train spotter, some specker would come up and say, actually, you're not. And I can prove it. But nobody ever did because they no, couldn't you, deny it. You, and so I began to use it then just to be annoying. But it doesn't actually mean anything. In fact, it's very vulgar to say. I've been published as a poet more than anyone else in the country. You know, it's just one of those weird things. It was just one of those weird things that happened. And I used it as a kind of club to hit people with for a while. Then I stopped. But not before it got out to the press. What a lovely man that Martin Newell is. 
hitting people with a club. Um, of poetry, yes. What a hard, a hard man. Of, come and have a go if you think you're barred enough. Oh, I like it. I like it. Um, well, we're going to pop off screen, all of us, Martin, except Jeanette, because she gets to do her weekly poem of the week. Does she sing and, and dance? She <laughs> can you, do Martin, everything. in private. Yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, uh, so I'll take you off screen so you can get a preview later. Um, we'll be off screen. Um, myself Are you going to do a jingle? Jingle, we're gonna do a jingle. Time. We're gonna do a jingle. Oh. Where's it gone? It's poem of... <laughs> He's cut the jingle off as well. Um, it's right, so poem huh? of the week. <laughs> it's always man Sorry, sorry, Jim. <laughs> That's lovely. I love having a jingle, as you all know. So this week's poem, um I'm in esteemed company here with Martin Newell, so I thought I'd get out some big guns here. And so I'm going to read a poem by Pam Ayres. And unlike last week, I'm not going to do any accents. You'll be very pleased to hear. So this poem is, bearing in mind, we're all going to be starting to go out a bit more, hopefully soon. Uh, I started thinking about this the other day. And I'm going to read Satnav by Pam Ayres. I have a little Satnav. It sits there in my car. A sat-nav is a driver's friend. It tells you where you are. It gives me full instructions, especially how to drive. It's 60 miles an hour, it says. You're doing 65. It tells me when to stop and start and when to use the brake and tells me that it's never, ever safe to overtake. It tells me when a light is red and when it goes to green. It seems to know instinctively just when to intervene. It lists the vehicles just in front and all those to the rear. And taking this into account, it specifies my gear. I'm sure no other driver has so helpful a device. For when we leave and lock the car, it still gives its advice. It fills me up with counselling. Each journey's pretty fraught. So why don't I exchange it and get a quieter sort? Ah, well, you see, it cleans the house, makes sure I'm properly fed. It washes all my shirts and things and keeps me warm in bed. Despite all these advantages and my tendency to scoff, I only wish that now and then I could turn the bugger off. <laughs> that was Sat Nav by Pam Ayres. And um, yeah, Martin, I, I have to say, I've read a few of your poems on the show before. So um, it's nice that you read your own today. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Jeanette. I, I realised when I cut my face off, I will cut the jingle off. Let's have Martin standing up again. A lovely poem, Jeanette. There he is. There's Martin dancing. <laughs> He's dancing in his head to your, your jingle. Oh, yeah, you like my jingle, I Martin. I yeah, wrote it was a delay. <laughs> uh, Pam Ayers is actually great. She should be poet laureate. Yes, and I that's agree. one of the reasons I have no respect for the, the 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 poetry establishment. She should have been poet laureate years ago, she, because she is the most popular. And as my partner, who worked in a bookshop for a long time, says, she her books fly off the shelves. There is no great fanfare in the quality lit sections when she has a book out and she outsells everybody and she could probably fill the mercury for a couple of weeks if she wanted to. She should give more than Johnny Clark, even he says so. He and I are both indebted to her because she brought popular poetry to television in 1975 or whatever it was. She was on Opportunity Knox. She's a serious force. And if you ever see, if you just watch one of her gigs online, she's a funny woman. She's a very adept comedian and highly bright, you know, and she just doesn't get that, that credit. They, they are sniffy about her and I will never forgive them for that. How dare they? She should be Poet Laureate. I'm not saying Simon Armitage is bad, but he's a safe pair of hands, isn't he? He's a nice guy. I've met him. I've worked with him. But, you know, he doesn't. he's never going to sell as much as Pam Ayers. And That's and neither one. would Carol Ann Duffy or neither any none of them. Not since Betjamin has a poet been so popular. Mm. There we you know she 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 shifts a lot of stuff. Controversy in the poetry world, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we bring it to you on a Friday afternoon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Is it Friday already? <laughs> it's Friday. Cry. I just look at it like um, 
it's it it costs it, you can do it you can forgive once um but to sort of have to challenge things it's it's quite exhausting and i don't disagree with you but i just think if i just forgive once anything then i don't have to worry about it so much and that means they get off scot free of course martin but yeah of yeah, course yeah, yeah. That's that's the world for us. Let well, me read you. Some. Well, he's still walking. He's still walking around out there doing bad poetry. <laughs> Oi, stop that! <laughs> My daughter's there. been damaged for life. Give him an espo. Um, so funny, uh, Jeanette. Thank you. You're Jeanette awesome. loves her jingle. Says <laughs> says Sandy. Yeah, sorry about that. I've never written uh, a jingle before, and I yeah, like so, it. It's, it's, you know, I like it. I like it. I like it. I like it. John plays it, and it, you, it's up there with your jingles, John. Which I'm, it I'm absolutely an esteemed is. company all round. Absolutely, um, and we've got more esteemed company with us today, Mr. Not Martin Yule. Carol says, "Good one, Jeanette." Chrissy says, "Lovely," um, said Jeanette. Yes, good one, Jeanette. And um, let's read some comments about Martin um, because he's lovely, generally lovely and wonderful. Quite right, says Sandy. Quite right, Martin. Pam Ayres is a genius. Thomas says, great job. And that's referring back to Jeanette. She's getting all the attention, Martin. I'm sorry about this. Um, she says, got to. She's eye candy. <laughs> oh, I say. <laughs> She's well, got a Britney Spears on you. today. Um, <laughs> she's gorgeous she's really gorgeous um, stop it you make me blush don't um thomas says great job good to uh, got to love a bit of pam well read too uh janina says pam Ayres sold out the mercury in minutes when she played and was absolutely uh. lovely and elmia echoes that is saying pam Ayres is great so there we go martin there we go janette to uh, poets, well, three if you include Pam Ayres. <laughs> well, pe um, people like her. That's the thing. Yeah, I think they like her a lot of the same reason they like you, Martin. That she writes things. She doesn't force her rhymes. They she writes it so well that it comes naturally. I don't like it um, when people change structures of sentences just so the word that rhymes is at the end. And I think a lot of. Um, Music lyricists do that as well, and I, that's it's kind of lazy writing. Whereas your poems rhyme effortlessly, or it appears effortlessly, and I like that in the same way I like Pam Ayres. It's still better to have rhyme than not rhyme. Very absolutely, often. absolutely, definitely. Yeah. I only read yeah. poems on here that rhyme. Lots of lot of things that I hear that are supposed to be poets that won award. Do you know? It's unusual to find a poet who hasn't won an award now. Every poet who visits various poets, they've always the award winning, and you find it some prize that you've never heard of, like the, the Threlkeld Prize. And you look it up and you find Threlkeld's a place in Cumbria near Keswick or, or something. And you think, why? Well, okay. But I won playground equipment of the week. That's my prize. <laughs> that's the thing. Everything's got an award or a prize. Everybody gets a prize. I think it's wrong. We need losers so they can be beautiful. Uh, well, we're here for you, Martin, if you need <laughs> Thank <to>. you. Um, <laughs> so make me yeah. beautiful. <laughs> oh, God bless you, darling. Um, well, I must admit, I, I've not read loads of poetry in my time. I did used to enjoy Betjamin, but he was of his time. And the best poet um, I've read in the last 20 years is with us today. And I'm not just saying that. I really think you've got that Who touch about it, it just <laughs> reaches me. Thank you you. reach me in parts that hasn't been reached since um, Harp Lager. You get Lager. to the bottom of the glass, you know what I mean? I re reach, the, reach the poets that other, that, that other, other rhymesters don't. <laughs> yeah, now you reach my undergarments, and I'm just putting that out in the public. Um, it's That's a scary. joy having you with us. We're just going to uh, finish off, but before we do, we should give you the opportunity to say about your new album. You've got a new album coming. Yeah, but it's not it's not finished yet, and I don't even know um, what it's called. But it's I've been working on it all okay. through all through the um, the the staying in period. I refuse to call it staying lockdown. Lockdown. That sounds so important. So just so some BBC middle class overeducated person on Radio Fear can say lockdown. Roadmap, like they can sound all you know butch and important when all they do is a bit of jogging and a bit of news reading. So he well, that, that would sound a bit Alan Parker. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a flak jacket word, isn't it? It's one of those words you can, you know, you know, they you get the idea that some of those people up in the news departments are just wearing a flak jacket the whole time, hoping that something's going to go off so they can start sounding all quasi military. Well, I know, yeah, I don't know, I know, I know military people, while, um, and I like they, them. 
they didn't wear trousers until they made them stand up and then they had to wear trousers because like me they were just in a jacket no underwear or trousers underneath in the underwear. same here same here i've just got the fishnets on since lockdown you know where well, i noticed that when you was doing that little boogie move which was quite interesting <laughs> it livened up my friday afternoon i could tell you that fishnets and the kitten hill courts that's all i need for a day nowadays work well, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, he, he's been with us this afternoon. He's a lovely guest and he's a, a lovely, talented gentleman. Um, and we are very, very fond of him. We'll have him back when we come back to our physical sessions. And we'll certainly have him back on this show. I hope you've enjoyed the wonderful Martin Yule. Thank you very much. For have you finished with us part. now? Yes. Yeah, well, you're done. <laughs> done you're out of here. Son. Thank you. Hey, I'm so out of here. <laughs> yeah, you're so yesterday. You're yesterday, today and tomorrow. Let's, let's do this again. But but maybe okay, not on Wednesday. Darling. That's when I see my pineapple therapist, Miss Kowalski. Okay. She's strict okay. but terribly merciful. She's a beautiful dame. She's a beautiful dame. Uh, Mercy. Thanks, we'll see you soon. That's Martin Wall. Okay. I'm only take, I'm only taking him off screen because we only have room for four screens, and we only have <laughs> room for four screens so that I can get the outro credits on. I'll say thank you to Martin Yule. Thanks, mate. We had a good laugh and some lovely poetry. Thank you to Jeanette over there, Tom down there. My name's John O'Casson. Thanks to the National Lottery Community Fund for supporting our work. And big time thanks to you all for joining us. We'll be back next week, 50, next week, next Friday at 1 o'clock. Do join us. It's not a special show other than it's our 50th, 50th episode, which I think is pretty nifty and shifty. Um, we'll see you then at 1 o'clock. Have a great week. Bye for now. It's time for us to go. Goodbye. Goodbye, dry a tear, baby dear, from your eye. We've all got a tale to tell. Times were not always so. But putting it all aside, we made it through by and by. It's warm and toasty in here. Share our laughter, sometimes tears. You'll be welcome with a cup of tea And a biscuit, maybe two or three -da -da -da. Wrapped in a little white cloth -da -da -da. Cooking for hours in the old iron pot -da -da -da. There's a jam roly-poly for tea -da -da -da. Enough for you and Dad and Grandma and me What did we like the most? Sandwich or peas on toast. Nothing could come close. The bubble and squeak the day after our sun.